Our coverage continues into the murders of four University of Idaho students. Brian Kohlberger was arrested for the brutal slayings of the students who were found in their off-campus home. Now, Kohlberger faces four counts of first-degree murder and one count of felony burglary. Our very own Anjanette Levy sat down with attorney Shannon Gray, who is representing the family of victim Kaylee Gonsalves. Let's take a listen as he shares his thoughts on what the Gonsalves family had to say after the 19-page probable cause affidavit was released, as well as the family's feelings on one of the surviving roommates crossing paths with the suspect. Well, I think it was a lot more information than anybody expected. Um, I've read probable cause affidavits in the past, um, just through my, as a prosecutor and a criminal defense attorney, and this was pretty extensive. It kind of lays out the prosecution's case. Um, I'm sure there's, there will be additional evidence that they have that they haven't released in the probable cause affidavit, but gives you a good guideline for how they determined that it was the defendant in this case. And so, you know, you have the the automobile you have the with the video and the and the um uh the pings off of the telephone records and um and the dna evidence and the witness information and and there's a lot of little and the timing of the things uh, that happen so a lot of information in there uh to digest and so but i thought it was you know it was well written and i thought they did a good job of it i think they wanted to make sure they had probable cause <laughs> So they put plenty of information in there to establish that. Um, so we're just hopeful that, you know, they've said all along that they not only want an arrest, but they want a conviction. So we're hopeful that, you know, there's, I, I you know, you have to really realize that there's probably three other crime scenes that, or areas to gather evidence still available. You still have his apartment, you still have the car, and you also have his parents' house. And who knows what they're going to find in that, those locations and what evidence they might gather as well as all the information that might be coming in now that people know who he is, right? So um, a lot of circumstantial evidence I expect will be coming into the police department about different things about the defendant and any connections that he may have had to any of the victims in the case. We all have to remember that she is a victim in this case. You know, I don't know if anybody can, you know, everyone's there to second guess what happened uh, and how she should have or might have, could have reacted. Um, you know, she states in the, I think in the affidavit that she froze in that moment and then went back in her room and, you know, and ultimately the 911 call wasn't made until later, you know, eight hours later, I believe, or something along those lines. But who knows? I mean, people, maybe she saw him and maybe she thought he was going out for a smoke on the, out on the, out on the deck and coming back in. Who knows what was going through her mind? And but I don't think anybody should be putting any blame or anything on her about anything. And the family feels the same way. She is, she's going through a traumatic uh, incident where she had four roommates that were murdered. Uh, she was able to garner some information that helped out the affidavit, uh, the identification of the black clothes, of the black mask over his nose, uh, the bushy eyebrows, approximate height, uh, approximate build very critical to the uh, investigation. I mean, if they bring in a guy that's 6'6 and doesn't match the description, right, then you have a different, but it, it seems in line with what, what the defendant looks like in this case to a certain degree. So, and maybe they find dark clothes and they find a dark mask in, in some of the locations that they've done. So, She's really, it's, I think everyone should be praising her for getting an identification and being able to give that, that solid information there and, and not look about uh, what she might have or could have or uh, done, because we have no idea what mental state she was going through at that time. It's easy to criticize. It's harder to be kind nowadays. So, you know, everybody's got their idea of what could have, should have, or would have done um, and just show her some kindness and grace, um, you know, if I'm I'm pretty sure no one's uh, more critical uh, than she is of herself on things. So I don't think any anybody needs to beat her up and anything. And reality of it is, she's providing really great evidence regarding the identification of the defendant in the case, and uh, that's pivotal. Um, I, I think in a pro it is pivotal in a prosecution, uh, having someone that that can give an uh, an identification of the, the general, you know, I build and, and what he looks like and things like that. So. All right. And with that, I'm joined alongside criminal defense attorney, Brian Silver and criminal defense attorney, Casey Early. Welcome guys. Thank you so much for joining me, Brian. I'm going to start with you. You just heard Shannon Gray there talk about 
uh, you know, the victim's roommate there. What are your thoughts on her encountering the killer and waiting so long to react? So a couple things come to mind. I, I think it comes down to two possibilities. First of all, she had a bone chilling encounter with this guy. I mean, just think you're a homeowner, you're in your house. Everyone's worst nightmare is some guy is in their home at three, four o'clock in the morning who doesn't belong there. I mean, if there's ever a case for the Second Amendment, I think this is it, right? Um, however, the other side to it is eight hours does seem like a rather long period of time to call the police after four of your roommates have just been slashed to death. It, it definitely raises a legitimate question. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with asking a question. You know, certainly when an arrest has been made and someone is looking at the death penalty uh, for their uh, actions in regard to this case, uh, I think the tough questions do have to be asked and the tough questions do have to be answered. Uh, but it can be done without putting blame. It can be done without pointing a finger. Uh, but certainly, uh, I'm sure the defense team will want to know why was there an eight-hour gap? I mean, the normal reaction would be to immediately call the police. Now, I understand someone might be scared. They might be in fear, of course. But eight hours is a very long time. And the question that comes to my mind that I would like to know is how did this guy make entry into the home? Uh, did he break in or was he not was he able to make uh, access without breaking in? Uh, and I think that's another thing that needs to be looked at. Well, the past few days, we've learned so many new details in the affidavit. Kasia, what do you make of the 19-page probable cause affidavit? What stood out to you most? That there was definitely an investigation. We have to remember that there was thousands of tips and calls into the community. And what a relief, not only for the family, but for the community. And the officers in this case had to basically shift through all of the uh, tips that came in, and they wanted to make sure that they had sufficient probable cause to make this arrest, in which they did. Although this case is certainly circumstantial, we have uh, DNA evidence that was found on the uh, leather knife holder. Uh, we have a potential uh, witness uh, that who saw him in the black clothing, although she didn't get an exact description, that may be sufficient with the other mountain circumstantial evidence, the cell phone ping, and also the vehicle. I do believe uh, law enforcement um, had him on a radar and was definitely building up this evidence to ensure that they had the right person. Um, of course, the community, the families, we all want to know why. So uh, the, the motive is still a question, although that's not a factor, that's not an element to the crime, and that's not uh, what the prosecution has to prove. That theory will definitely come uh, once we go to trial. What was his motive? What was his connection? So although we have this detailed 19-page uh, probable cause affidavit, and in my thousands of cases as a criminal defense attorney, they're typically two to three pages. So we know that this was detailed because you're dealing with multiple victims in this case, but it shows that law enforcement was doing a thorough investigation for the very beginning, and this will show and can't once it's handed off to the prosecution. Well, Brian, could we expect more evidence to be revealed in this case? Absolutely. You know, remember, a probable cause affidavit serves one legal function, and that's to justify an arrest. All the police need to do is put enough into a, an affidavit that establishes that the person they put into handcuffs and have taken into custody, that there's evidence behind that arrest. But it doesn't need to be in an Encyclopedia Britannica of evidence. And certainly, I can tell you, this is an ongoing investigation. You know, I'm sure a lot of people are going to come forward now that they know this gentleman has been arrested in charge of this crime. They might have additional information. Uh, there might be other information that is being analyzed. For instance, they might have forensic evidence that is being reviewed in a certain laboratory. Uh, but absolutely, and by the way, that's what trial is for. Trial is the moment where it's all laid out there. And I think as we get closer to trial, and certainly once we get into a trial posture, the big picture and everything that there is to be known about this case will likely be brought out. Well, what's interesting is in recent days, we've also learned um, that internet sleuths have been claiming to see Brian Kohlberger at the vigil, at the memorial. And this is causing a lot of controversy because people are now saying social media is really getting involved and internet users are really getting involved. How does this get in a way when this goes to trial, Casey? 
Well, again, I, I agree with my colleague. This is definitely an ongoing investigation because now you're getting more information now that they know who the suspect is. So, of course, I do believe that law enforcement will follow up on those tips and determine whether or not that information is sufficient. I mean, if he was at the memorial, what, again, what is the connection? What is the motive? Why did he decide to uh, leave two other victims behind and not, um, you know, kill the other ones? Like, there is so many unanswered questions, but... Uh, of course, law enforcement will have a continuing obligation uh, to, to continue this investigation. And, of course, the prosecutors will utilize this evidence to seek a conviction. Brian, were you surprised when you heard that he could have been at that vigil? Is this something that alleged killers do? So I would say I was surprised and I was not surprised. On the one hand, it's not uncommon for uh, offenders who offend out of a major mental health problem, as would be the case here, uh, to return to the scene of the crime. You know, you hear that with arsonists, you hear that uh, with other offenders. Uh, I'm not a psychotherapist, I couldn't explain it to you, but it's definitely a behavior pattern uh, that has been seen before. Uh, but of course, naturally, it also surprises me because you would think that's not the intelligent thing for someone to do after they've just murdered the person who is the subject of that uh, memorial. Um, but then again, you know, someone who's a, who has a sociopathic personality, as the true offender would be in this case, uh, that person's brain does not perceive and interact with reality like a normal, healthy person. That's why they do what they do. Um, so to expect normal behavior out of an abnormal person, to me, uh, really doesn't make much sense. Uh, but, you know, it's yet to be seen if that actually was him. I happened to review the photo. And uh, I think the verdict is still out. I see the semblance. It certainly has to do with the posture and the shape of his head. I thought maybe the hairline was a little different. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, it doesn't move the needle forward when it comes to the evidence that's needed uh, for conviction. Uh, I, I certainly think there's uh, more important issues to be focusing our attention on. But it's a good thing the public is this involved. The more involved the public is, the better our judicial system functions. And I think moving ahead, people also want to see if there are more people who are involved in this case as well. All right, great discussion so far. We're going to take a quick break here on Law and Crime, but much more trial coverage and analysis is ahead. We'll be back.